and it will tell us when we're live, and then you can begin, Cliff. All right, so minimize. Okay, you ready? Okay, we're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, my, my name is Clint Zollinger. I'm the president of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of North Canton. Um, obviously, this is the first time we've ever conducted a meeting in this way. Uh, so I, as you can tell, there are going to be some logistical issues. Uh, one thing that you're going to notice is the parties, the people that are going to testify, you're not muted. You're not going to be muted. Uh, it's a, it's going to be really important. We try not to talk over one another. As you're giving your presentations and testifying, some of the members of the board will probably have questions. I, I know I will. Um, I will try to slowly interject so that the court reporter can do her job. And I just ask that you, you try to do the same when responding. And let's try to avoid talking over one another. Uh, with that, then, the first thing we'll do is we'll call the roll of the board. So go ahead. Please. Mr. Zollinger? I'm here. Ms. Boyjan? I'm here. Mr. Streb? Here. Mr. LePage? Here. Ms. Clevenger? Here. Okay, um, all board members are present, so we have a quorum. Uh, just be aware that it takes three of us to vote in a certain way for something to be granted or, or denied, uh, majority of the board. Uh, the first or the next item uh, is um, a submission of our no November 26, 2019 meeting minutes for approval. Uh, we were given these in advance for our review. I would entertain a motion and a second to approve the minutes as, as submitted. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. Oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, so why don't we call the roll uh, for this motion? Ms. Clevenger? Yes. Ms. Boyjan? Yes. Mr. Zollinger? Yes. Mr. Treb? Yes. Mr. LePage? Abstain. Okay, that, that motion passes. We'll now go to the next item on our agenda. Uh, would you please call out the, the application number and the, the name in the address, please? Sorry. And then he said, read the number and the address. Application number 20, NCZBOA-0001, Catherine and Tanya Anthony, 602 East Maple Street, North Canton, an appeal for a gazebo located in the corner side yard. Okay, before we go forward with this, um, we need to have anyone who's going to testify or get up and speak, um, other than attorneys, uh, be sworn in by the court reporter. So I'm going to have her go ahead and do that now for the for anyone who's going to testify with regard to this application. Okay. Would you like me to introduce the three people that I have here potentially that will? So you at least have them identified. Oh, yeah. Right That'd Is be that fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this phone, Mr. Osborne. Give us a moment to unmute Mr. Osborne so he can also swear in. Okay. okay. Yes, I'm here. I'll swear. Uh, your name, please. Tanya Anthony. Your name? Your name? I can't hear. Okay. I have a Mary Hakem, Katie Anthony, and Tanya Anthony. Thank you. Those going to testify, please raise your right hand. That includes me, Osborne. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing mm -hmm. will so help you, God? I do. I do. I do. That was three affirmatives from um, my office. Okay. okay so you check now until it's his turn. All right, thank you. Now what we'll do, we're, what we're going to do is I'm going to have the people, anyone who wants to speak on behalf of the applicant, go ahead and speak, identify yourself and your address uh, when you do. And I think, Mr. Dahl, I'm sure that'll be you at first. And then 
we will, you'll, I'll let you, Mr. Dahl, let anyone testify that you want to have testify. And, and then you'll entertain and entertain questions from the board. And when you, when we're done there, we'll have anyone who wants to speak against the application, have an opportunity to speak and entertain questions from the board as well. So I'll turn it over to the applicant uh, at, to start with. Thanks. Okay. I just want to make sure that everybody has uh, my notice of uh, appeal to the uh, notice of violation of the North County Canton housing ordinances uh, that I filed May 1, 2020. That would be that document. Uh, that you have a copy of my brief that was requested of me uh, that I submitted last Friday. That, that would be in race 602 East Maple, Pellants, Catherine, and Tanya Anthony. Appellee, City of North Canton. And last but not least, the first document that I saw up there was the uh, variance application. I guess I would start by asking if the members of the board have had an opportunity to read my notice of appeal to notice of violation dated uh, May 1, 2020. Yeah, we, we were sub given these items last week. Uh, um, I have reviewed everything. Um, I, if anyone on the board has, said, has not seen these items or has not received them, uh, let us speak up right now. But I think we all have this. Yeah, please let me know if you've reviewed them. Because I don't, I mean, I'm not a typical lawyer. I don't have to listen to myself talk. <laughs> So if, you, if there's anybody that hasn't read uh, most particularly the appeal or the brief, if you'd speak up now, I would appreciate it. No, I think we all have it. Okay. So I, I mean, I'd, I'm going to ask that they be, obviously they're already part of the record in court that I would, I would submit both of these documents as uh, to be included in the record that's prepared for any future appeal, potentially. Okay. Is that, ex is that acceptable? Um, if I'm hearing no objective from anyone from the city I, I, or anyone else on the board, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, thank you very, very much. Included with that was uh, included with my brief. There was a uh, case cited that was uh, 2003 Ohio 2790. That that be submitted uh, as part of my brief. I'm assuming that it is and or was. Yes. Yes, that's, it was. That's it. So I would ask that that would be submitted onto the record. Uh, and with that, I mean, my, my basically, we're just saying that we've got a house, it's a narrow lot, because of the situation that it does sit on a sidewalk, uh, these people have been saddled with two front yards and have taken, have had a significant portion of their property limited for outdoor recreational uses. Uh, and it's a hardship. Uh, there's nothing about the gazebo that's going to cause this property to not yield a reasonable re return. Nothing about this gazebo diminishes the value of this property. Matter of fact, it's my understanding that if and when these ladies decide to move, the gazebo is going with them. So there's no permanency at all to this gazebo. So we have a fence in place around the back 
third, I'm saying, of what would normally be considered a side yard, that being the yard on Pershing that includes the backyard of the property. The gazebo is included inside of that fenced in area. Uh, and therefore, any variance that we would request, even though, I mean, would be obviously minimal. There are no site. One of the biggest things that drives me nuts about driving through small communities is people that build shrubs at the corners of roads where it makes it absolutely impossible to see around. <laughs> Frankly, I got a neighbor that puts up, that uh, has sunflowers growing within three feet of the road. It makes it impossible for me to see on a fairly busy street. So we don't have that here. The well, I, Mr. Dahl, I got a, I, I'm sorry, let me, I have a question for you because I want to, I want to get, please. I want to figure out what you're, you're seeking here. There's three violations that are alleged. Exactly. One is the requirement of a zoning certificate. My under, my take on this is that you're just, you're appealing a ruling of the city. That's not a variance request. That's a, re, you're requesting us, uh, that's an appeal okay. by by you uh, of the city's decision that a, are you saying a zoning certificate I, is not okay. required here? Okay. Yes, I am. However, you have put me in a position based on how you have presented what I'm trying or what I was told I needed to accomplish today. I was told to file essentially a variance application, okay? Mm -hmm. Before I could even do anything with my three appeals, okay? So I made the assumption, along with some brief instructions from your law director, that I should address those 10 items that were, that are included uh, in your variance application. You know, I was specifically told to address those while sitting in front of you. Okay. That's yeah, not I, I'm proceeding the way I am. Okay. Right? And frankly, that's the one thing that I didn't probably brief as far as, no, I don't feel that I need to file a, uh, a zoning for a zoning permit. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the side yard setbacks requirements were met. And, you know, again, I don't need to be, I don't believe, I'm assuming everybody on this board is intelligent enough to get elected and intelligent enough to read my brief and understand what my, what my points are. Therefore, the well, sir, we're not elected. If we're, with, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not elected. We're appointed. Okay, and we aren't being paid for this. Uh, uh, we're we're taking an independent look at this, and right. I want to get. I'm trying to get straight on what we're doing here. There's three violations alleged. The first one is a zoning certificate. Right. That appears to be an appeal. I understand that you had to file a variance application, but um, it looks like for the first violation, it's an appeal by you, and you're saying a zoning certificate is not required. So, and that's what you're, you, you've, you've said that that's the case. So that's the, the, now we'll address that in a second, but the violations two and three do appear to be more in the form of a variance request where you're asking us to, um, you know, look at that and say whether there, whether there is a violation or, or, and if there is, and whether, you know, that, that you'd want a variance granted for those two. I, it sounds to me like we have three things to act on for you tonight. Okay. I'll, I'll accept that. Um, now, as far as the the first violation um, or alleged violation, the zoning certificate, um, you, you mentioned, the, the, I see that you, you stated that this is not a fixture. This, um, 
this gazebo. I've driven by it. I, I, it looks big, but I, cu I couldn't see how it was fastened to the ground. Is there any, is it nailed into the ground? Is it anchored into the ground? No is it anchors just sitting whatsoever. On, okay, it's just sitting on the ground? Just sits there. Yep. Okay. Like any, uh, any of the thousands of uh, play sets. Okay, so it, it may be, let me, uh, let's, let me let me accept that, that your position that it's not a building as defined in the zoning code. And I'm referencing 1125.02 paragraph 11. How then is this not a structure as defined in 1125.02 subparagraph 111? Because that definition says, a structure, as far as the city of North Canton is concerned, is anything that just requires location on the ground or attachment to a building. So that sounds like it could just be sitting on the ground and still be considered a structure. Uh, would that include uh, somebody sitting on the ground? Does that include a chair? Does that include a child's play set? Does that include a pergola, a pool, a teeter totter? Uh, or any of those items? It says anything constructed or erected. So I'd imagine anything like a place set that, you know, requires construction or erection it, that, that that possibly could. All right. Well, I mean, I agree with you. And there are hundreds of these, probably thousands. No, there, I, I take that back. There's definitely thousands of those things. Uh, and let's see, I'm, I, I don't want to judge ages, but I think we've got some kids, some folks here that have kids and or toddlers and or grandchildren who have these in their very backyard. Not that I, I haven't been to any of your houses and checked it out, but I would suggest that probably three or four people on this board have structures on their backyard. And I would say none of them. Permitted them. I could be wrong, but I mean, yeah. if not, they can each throw a stone from their property and hit a structure that meets that definition that wasn't permitted. Okay. To answer your question, by that definition, it's a structure. It was constructed. By the second half of the definition, it's not fixed to the ground in any way, shape, or form. And I think the Danbury Township Board of Zoning Appeals case specifically addresses, I mean, I couldn't have found a case that's more on point. I mean, these people, not only did, was it a front side yard, it was a front yard, front yard. Yeah. You know, I look at that case and actually, I mean, accessory buildings, it talks about, it has a definition for accessory buildings that's similar, but the difference is Danbury Township said that in that township, structures didn't need a permit. In our, in North Canton, they do. I didn't see the actual Danbury, but like I said, I'm more than willing to take this. I, this case to me says, congratulations, Mr. Dahl, uh, you don't need a permit. But again, I, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I did not read every Danbury zoning ordinance. I just what was I, in the was, case, and it was, to me, <clears throat> very straightforward in what it said. Yeah. And if you in, if you try to include the broad structural definition, uh, safe built is going to be very 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 busy, and we'll make sure that they're very 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 busy. Uh, if Mr. Osborne can come from two or three neighborhoods away and claim a zoning violation of my clients, 
then my clients have free reign to travel anywhere in North Canton and point out the matter of fact, I will let you know that your zoning, uh, Mr. Van Gundy, already has a list of probably 100 or 200 residences supplied by my clients. And I would be kind of interested to find out if any of those were active on. Look, that well, is not the direction I want this meeting to go in. I want this, I want us to work something out where my people can keep their gazebo. That's all I want. I don't want to cause problems or anything else. All right. Well, I mean, just, I mean, our job isn't, we're not, this isn't a mediation. I mean, you're in an adjudicatory proceeding right now. So, right. I understand um, that. If you want to try to work something out, you can always dismiss your application and try to do that. If, if you have, you've already tried that and it hasn't worked, then that's why you're here. Right. That's why I'm here. Um, but let me, let me ask you this. Um, Go ahead. You did submit, like, I, I, you know, one thing I am interested in, you know, I don't want to see anybody treated differently um, for any reason. And one thing that always, you know, that always inclined me toward granting a variance or, or granting an appeal is if you can point to a situation where a structure similar to this uh, was granted or erected without a permit and the city's aware of it. And, and it was under this current ordinance, not something from a long time ago under a prior ordinance. 602. Uh, that, that, that if you can give me an apples to apples situation where they, this wasn't, where somebody was treated differently, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to hear that. And I want it in the record. Uh, you know what? I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to let Katie Anthony read off uh, and you tell her when you want her to stop reading off addresses. But I will, however, submit to you that in my brief of, uh, I'm not sure what I didn't do it. I apologize. There is a picture. Yes, on Fair Oaks. Of a uh, house that uh, no zoning permit was pulled. And that structure not only is a structure, but is a building as defined by your definitions with no you're, zoning permit. You're talking uh, about 965 Fair Oaks. You're talking about 965 Fair Oaks. Is that what yeah? Yeah, um, I did I I saw that, and that is that's a question I have for the city. Um you know what's what's the deal with that? That looks like it's pretty new. When when was that erected? If we have some idea, three weeks, two weeks ago. Oh, but that was a problem. Uh, I we weren't naming names yet. Now I can have Ms. An Ms. Anthony uh, begin reading off names. And addresses, if you would, if you would like. Well, I, I, I had a question for someone. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Van Gundy or somebody could answer the question. Uh, can let us provide some information on this structure at, at on Fair Oaks. What's the deal? Is did they get a permit for this or? I don't believe so. I'm going to double check that right now. Unless. Something, no, that was not permitted. I wanted to double check something didn't come in you know, since now and when this was filed. But as of now, there is no uh, permits on this. 965 Fair Oaks for this detached structure. Okay. If, if we were, and I'll save Mr. Van Gundy time, uh, the list of 100 plus houses that we do have uh, have all been checked online to see if permits or permitting had been taken had taken place on these properties or these structures. And of this, how many do you have on the list? If you just 
Just tell us a number. 100, she, she stopped at 100. And none of them have, none of them have been permitted. Zero, zilch. Do you know when they were built? You know what, if I have to subpoena every one of them, I will. But I believe this came in, your, your zoning came into effect in 96 or when was your zoning? When did it come the current, in? The current ordinance, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, was 2007. That's the ordinance we're, we're working with. That's correct. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll subpoena everybody in North Canton, but I would say that 50% of them uh, are included in that time frame. I mean, 15 years, gazebos haven't even been that. These uh, instant up gazebos haven't even been popular for 15 years. And there's plenty of them out there. And uh, uh, the picture that I sent you of the home that I sent you, I've only seen, that's the second one of that type of structure, which is essentially a greenhouse, but it's a, it's a wood frame greenhouse. That's the first, the second one of those I've seen. Uh, one of them, the first one being uh, the guy behind me uh, in Lake Township that built one. So that structure definitely is, is well, we know when that was built. So you, you take 2007 and you figure out when uh, gazebos became popular and it's not going to take much to figure out how many of these people have structures that fall within the permitting uh, requirement. And again, the whole structure idea is... I mean, that's about as vague as you can get. I'll shut up now. I told you I didn't want to listen to myself talk. I just have a very simple question. Why, even Danbury Township, that the case you cited, is very clear in saying you should always call first to verify whether or not a permit is required. Why wasn't a phone call made before this structure was put up? Well, essentially, we looked it up <clears throat> online, and we asked everybody including the guy the people that put this thing together if these were anything that had to be permitted to be built but did you ask the permit department no uh, we well, that's my question I, why a simple phone call wouldn't that have gotten well, us i mean again i have a problem when a simple phone call by a member of your own administration couldn't be made prior to constructing an item so that they should have called turn it right around to you but they no. did their research they did their research they asked the people that construct for the local large box companies and again we're talking sam's right mm -hmm. sam's club and i guarantee you again if you want us to spend the time, we can point to any number of Sam's gazebos in North Kenton, because every time I go to Sam's, I see people from North Kenton there buying whatever. So I know there's gaze North uh, Sam's gazebos in North Kenton, and I can point to them. And they've well, only been selling those. We also checked with Home Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart, and they all basically came up with the consensus these aren't required to be permitted. Plus, they checked your website, your information, your source of information for the community. And does our source of information say, don't call and ask first? <laughs> that's that's my question. That's, that's all I okay, want to know, why a simple first. phone call wasn't made first. You know what? You're clever and... You got me. I'm not trying to be clever. I had a question. Uh, this is, here, please. Hey, Chairman, I have a question for council, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Who's going now? This is Martin Van Gundy. Hi, Mr. Van Gundy. 
Hello. Um, one of the questions that came up, and we weren't able to identify a registered contractor who had installed the um, structure here. Um, now, the question is, I mean, generally, that contractor registration is required to cover insurance, bonding requirements, so forth. Generally, they're a bit more familiar with the local regulations as they come in. Um, was the installer a registered contractor in the city of North Canton? That would be something between you and the, the city of North Canton and that contractor. So our records, we were not able to identify a registered contractor for this property. So um, you never the, asked. Uh, uh, contrary, I believe the inspectors did. And yeah. they had also requested access to the property to uh, do a, an inspection of the structure and were denied that information as no, well. That is, that is false. That is false. All right, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Um, I'd just, like to address just, Ms. Clubby. Just hold on a second, hold we're on. Gonna do that. We're gonna do that. You're, you're, everyone's gonna have a chance to talk. Let's just not interrupt one another. Um, uh, Mr. Van Gundy, are you done? Yes, thank you. All right, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Dahl. If you want to, if if your client wants to talk, that's fine. Uh, just Whatever. briefly, so I can save a little bit of time, uh, though it doesn't sound like I'm trying to. My clients are saying unequivocally, and they will state under oath right now that at no time did anybody ask to come in and inspect the structure. They couldn't because of COVID, all right? And at no time did anybody specifically request or even generally request the name of the contractor, the installer, or whomever put together the gazebo. Okay. Uh, so, let me, let me, okay. Let me, I, that, one question I want to follow up though, like I Miss Clevenger's question. I, that was a question I was going to have too. You know, your clients have been before this board before, and I know it, it wasn't the most pleasant of experiences for them, but um, you know, they're aware of this process. And so I have that, I, I wonder why too, why, um, why there wasn't just, Hey, look, we're going to erect this gazebo. I understand they checked with the, the people they bought it from, but why wouldn't you? Okay. Call the city. Hold on. Why wouldn't you call the city and just and say, "Hey, listen, just to be careful, we want to we want to do this. Are you okay with it?" And and then you would and then that would have taken care of this problem. We wouldn't even have to be here. Okay. So to address that, um, prior to purchasing the gazebo, I personally said, "Let's check and make sure we don't need to to permit this." So we went on to the North Canton website, the, the city website, whatever, and it directed us to the, it said that North Canton implemented the Ohio Residential Code as of July 1st, 2019. So it directed us straight there. So we went there and we, we read their building restrictions or whatever, and the gazebo fit within that. So we were like, oh, we're good. Okay. So we bought it from Sam's Club, we asked Sam's Club even, and then after the fact, we were in Home Depot, and I asked the gentleman, because they had gazebos there, and I, I would, because it was still playing with me, because I knew that, you know, certain somebody was going to turn us in, because we can't even have a mailbox, so the guy at Home Depot said, no, it's not a permanent structure, and then when we got our letter of violation, we asked our realtor about it. And she said, well, even in real estate, when you go to move, you have to list that as a personal property item. It's not permanent. It's not a permanent structure. So that, to answer your question, Mrs. Clevenger, we did look into that. We didn't make a phone call. We went to your website, which directed us to that. And it says nothing about a gazebo or pergola. And then. But that doesn't answer my question. 
My and question we, is, why didn't you just call and ask? Well, that was my if, question. If, 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 yeah. Right. Would, would you, if you were buying a big play set with a swing and a slide, like everybody in our neighborhood has? Think, yeah, oh, I, I probably would. Probably would. No, well, I, I don't think that. As a member of your board, the city board didn't. An there official with the city didn't. And there's a hundred or. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Mr. Dahl, Mr. Dahl, if you have, uh, you've submitted the, the property at Fair Oaks, that picture. And right. I appreciate you doing that because that, that raises questions in my mind. If you have other properties that you feel are applicable here, you need to put them in the record and you, you need to you need to submit yeah. that evidence. You can't just okay. spout off and tell us, well, this property over here, or this about this person over here, that, that that means nothing to us. I will read them all off into the record. We have five council members that have structures on their property with no, with permit. no permit. Thank you. Well, you want it right into the record. Twelve hundred Seventh Street has a gazebo. One second. Uh, Katie Anthony. Wait. I'm going to object if if you're going to read uh, these uh, these addresses. You know, what what we need to know is when was uh, the, uh, these constructed. Did they apply for a permit? Did they have a variance? They did not apply for and a permit. You don't have the information for the board, then you're, you're not submitting. Well, you're, you're on, submitting. on the contrary, you're when was ours constructed? All right, listen. On the contrary, when was our gazebo constructed? What date and time? No, listen. No, listen. The only people asking questions right now are going to be our attorneys and board members. <laughs> this is information we asked. We, this is why we asked for this information in advance. For us to go through this now is, I mean, you, you're asking, we're not going to sit here all night and try to part and, and look through public records for over we supplied your dozens city. of properties. Through public records. Absolutely. But I, you know, I, so the one I have is, is 965 Fair Oaks, and I haven't heard an answer from this, you know, from the city as to why. That one, it was erected without a permit and what's going to, going to be done about it. Um, do you have any, uh, is, you know, if, if you have some others, I, I mean, I know you have others, but the problem is it's, it's going to be impossible for us to evaluate those right now. We have already submitted these to Mr. Van Gundy and safe built. Okay. So you have them. The city has them. Now, if you want us to do your permitting work for you, we can go under contract. Well, I'm going to uh, object. Um, we're, we're, we're not trying to be cute. We're, we're trying to, you may not feel that way, but we're trying to help your, your clients uh, through this process. And what... I, I think is important for the board that they they had uh, stated is that there there was no application provided to the building department for a permit. And when the building department stated that a permit was required, your clients declined. And then asked for you know, a way around this, and, and indeed a variance is, is a way around this. But to, to point out uh, the, the necessity of having that inspection, they very well may have found that perhaps a building permit may not have been required, but perhaps a zoning permit to make sure that the placement of that structure wasn't in a right of way, a line of sight, or uh, too close to the the main structure, and uh, you know perhaps just viewing the the, the photograph, I, I think you can see, you know, nearly immediately there's a there's a difference between the distance from that 
the gazebo or pergolo, whatever you, uh, you wish to call it, between the one that you are saying also doesn't have a permit with your clients. Okay, so are we drop? Are we now leaving issue one and moving on to issue? I believe that's issue three. Uh, before we do, I would like to add a few things here. As uh, you're referring to a list, and I'm scrolling through my memory, um, not recalling seeing anything being included with this variance. However. Uh, I am recalling a list that was sent via email to the nuisance abatement officer, Terry Stan, a number of months ago. And we did indeed follow up on every single one of those addresses that was provided to Mr. Stan. And we did find a number of those did have, in fact, permits and were not an issue. There were a number of them, I will say, that we were not able to verify. And as you know, the burden of proof is on the city to show that there's evidence demonstrating a violation. And on a number of those, we were not able to come up with proof establishing the date of construction as it relates to the ordinance currently in effect. So, um, that's that part. The second part I'd like to add is to address um, the chairman's question in regards to 965 Pharaohs. Uh, you know, as you know, there are a lot of things that happen uh, that we're not aware of, and um, this didn't come to our attention until this case here. Now, as part of that, we will follow up on that as unpermitted work and um, you know, make them aware that they do need a zoning permit. Now I will say outside of that, I don't see the same type of concerns that exist with the structure before you today. Um, so what, what's the difference between that structure and this one? Well, as Mr. Fox had identified, it appears that this does have at least 10 foot between that structure. I'm, and I'm just looking at the photograph here um, now, and I can't tell where the property line is, but it, this does not appear to be in a front yard or a corner side yard for that matter. I don't think that they don't all they care about street lines. But at any rate, it still requires a, a permit on that. It, the zoning permit, that is, and and we will follow up on that. Well, you should have Chuck driver on a lot more. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Oh, just briefly, the uh, where your website sends people is to the Ohio Residential Code of Ohio. And under uh, 10210, if you take a look at my brief, it talks about work exempt from approval. And it's not required. And you can read down through all of the uh, full definition, but it talks about uh, a, a whatever structure, if you will, of less than 120 square feet. Um, matter of fact, I think it might even be less than that. But regardless, 200. this is uh, 200. I'm sorry, you're right. And this is definitely uh, only 120 feet. So that's where, I mean, there are two intelligent women who make quite a bit of money and contribute quite a bit to North Canton that dotted their I's and crossed their T's, except for, you know, going to the city for every time they want to do anything. So, yeah, we didn't make a phone call, but it's not like we didn't attempt to get the homework done. Well, let me ask you this, and I don't know if you, no. I don't know if it's an answer a question you can answer, or if maybe if somebody from the city can answer this. 
the residential code of Ohio is a different body of law than our the municipal ordinances and zoning ordinances, and they they exist they coexist together. Right. Um, you know, if I look at I look at one section one hundred two point two of the residential building code, it 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 specifically says it's not meant to nullify provisions of state or federal law, and it, it allows municipal corporations to make further and additional regulations that aren't in conflict with other chapters of the building code and the revised code. Um, so I, th I don't know if there's a, you know, I, if somebody I, can tell me what the, how the interplay works here. I, I, to me, that's a, that's a separate permitting process. You got to go through a permitting process there. And then you also have to go through a local permitting process with that, whatever local government. Which you your know, website's the one that sent them there. Don't keep, quit, quit saying it's my website. I, we're an independent board, Mr. Dahl. Mr. Dahl, we're an independent board, okay? We're not employees of the city. The so, city's website. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, what is what is the interplay between the Residential Code of Ohio and the municipal ordinances? Because they're, they have to exist together. Yeah, Chairman, I can address that for you. Um, and for the record, I'm certified by the Ohio Board of Building Standards uh, certification number 5875 to perform the duties of the residential building official, um, particularly here in the city of North. And um, you know, I think first we need to look at the scope of the Residential Code of Ohio. Um, you know, and looking at that, that identifies what structures are covered in the Residential Code of Ohio, and you'll see it pretty much covers everything. And uh, as we go to the section that Mr. Dahl had identified in there, you know, it indeed covers structures similar to the one before you tonight. Uh, what I'd like to point out too, uh, as well, anyway, is that charging statement in 102.10. Um, where it talks about the approval shall not be required for the following work. However, this work shall comply with all applicable provisions of the rules of the board. Um, so with that said, you know, I'd like to point to the planning section of that code that is found in section 301.1 talks about the application. Essentially, it goes into the structural design, particularly the 301.2.1, the wind design criteria. That's going to require some type of uplift, uh, particularly, you know, in this case, as I mentioned, the wind. Uh, so this does not blow away and land in the middle of the street or uh, in the neighbor's yard harming something. Uh, that exists. Exemption only says the city is not required to do the inspections and do an approval that's defined and outlined in the Residential Code of Ohio. Um, that does not address zoning. And Chairman, you had pointed out the other section that I wanted to point to in 102.2 um, that does specifically say municipal Corporations may make further and additional regulations not in conflict with chapters 3781 and 3791 of the revised code or with the rules of the board of the building standards. Zoning codes do not conflict. They're not addressed in the residential code of Ohio. They do not conflict. The board of building standards recognizes that municipalities are permitted to regulate the zoning and setback and the character of a neighborhood. So they work together, they do not conflict. Uh, that's one of the areas where we do agree this structure is exempt from an approval from the Residential Code of Ohio. It's not exempt from a zoning approval. All right. And and if, if I may to add on to, to Mr. Van Gundy, that in addition to uh, pointing to the residential building code, our city's website also uh, has uh, links to the uh, uh, planning and zoning ordinance of the city of North Canton. The, uh, the, the definition of a, a structure there 
Uh, ironically, it is exactly the same as what you pointed out in Danbury Township. Indeed, as it stands today, the definition of the structure is exactly the same. Uh, Danbury, if you point to their uh, zoning department, uh, in addition, uh, states perhaps because of that case, that it recommends that anyone that does any building to police call to verify whether a permit is required before starting any construction. Uh, zoning permits are required for, but not limited to the following types of projects. And about the sixth, seventh one down, it lists accessory structures, including sheds, garages, gazebos. Uh, and to further that, a bit, Chairman, if I may, is when we were doing the research on various manufacturers of similar types of structures, uh, we had pulled up a number of manufacturer installation instructions, and each of them did include a similar um, statement, such as what uh, Mr. Fox had just read to you, advising the owner to consult with their local jurisdiction for any required permits. Okay. If they're going to object to it, we'll just, we'll take it to the court. Does anyone have, uh, anyone else on the board have any questions or comments regarding violation number one? No. No. Okay. Um, no. We'll bring that up to the court. Hey, Mr. Dahl, just so you know, we can hear your conversations. I don't want to. I don't want right. to listen in on anything. If you, there's nothing um, private. Well, every time I hit, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I just don't I wanna, have two different mute sections. That's I just want you to be aware of that. I, I don't want to. Yep. Okay. Uh, um, violation number two is the setback requirement of 35 feet um, and we're dealing with section 1135.05 D1B. Um, what's your position with regard to this? Is this, do you, do you, are you, is your position you need a variance or are you, is it your position this is not a violation? My, uh, simply, uh, I don't feel it's a violation. Second of all, it's not a 35 foot. Uh, if you read it, again, my brief covers it rather well. If you look up and down Pershing Avenue, there are buildings that are very close, uh, much, much closer to the sidewalk and the street than the gazebo is. Uh, and uh, I think if you read the law, it says in a built up area, you've got to take an average of that area. And if you look up and down Pershing, that's not, you're not going to get a 35 foot average. Okay. That was my question for you. Yeah. So what is the average distance then? If, if let's assuming you're right, what would the average distance be? And would the, would the gazebo still be too close? Uh, I have no idea what it is, but it's not 35 feet. Okay, I, mean, I can look at I can look at Saba and see they're like uh, 12 inches off the uh, off of Pershing. I can look uh, the house across the street and up one from Pershing. That's like uh, three feet off the road. I can look at the at the place across the street. Matter of fact, you can even look at the pictogram that I supplied of the all of the residences and structures along Pershing, and you can see that they're not 35 feet. You can eyeball them compared to what my client's fence line is and see that they're much closer. And I would say that you'd have to use Pershing 
for your average because it's apples and apples at that point in time. Because of the way that the houses on Pershing are situated. Okay, well, my, yeah, my, my I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going to assume you're right. And my question is, what would the average be? And would they still be in violation? Because if that's the case, then what's the point of making that argument? Well, I, if you're going to call, claim that my clients violate a 35 foot setback, they didn't. It's as simple as it's as simple and straightforward as that. It's not 35 feet. The average is less than that. Uh, you can look at the again the pictograph. It's not an exact measurement, but you can see that the, there's no way that the average is 35 feet. And it's just, you know, one thing I was taught in the law, if you don't get it right, you don't get a second swing at it. And if it's not 35 feet, and you're saying that my client are, are violating a 35 foot setback, they're not. That's the law they violated. Okay, whether they violate a 26 foot or a 15 foot or whatever setback, they weren't, it was never claimed that they violated anything but a 35 foot setback and they have not. So that claim is, is gone, it's moot. And no, I don't feel like I have to go out and measure every uh, property uh, on Pershing. Now, obviously, if we end up in the Court of Appeals, I'll do that. But I was hoping this was going to be a little bit less confrontational, and maybe it's my fault. But, you know, uh, I don't think uh, number two applies, period. Is there any other, do you have any other basis for that? I mean, anything about the the, the the gazebo itself or? I don't know that, uh, I'm not sure if that's one of the sections that's included under accessory structures or accessory buildings, that part. But if you read structure is not part of that, it talks about accessories. Accessory structures and accessory buildings and under any of the accessory definitions, this is not an accessory building or accessory structure. Well, that's, yeah, that's what, definition. that's what I'm getting at. I guess that's my question for the city. Uh, yes, let's assume the, the gazebo is just a structure and not a building. Does this ordinance apply to it? Yes, is... Let me and if you point me to the right provision because I'm having trouble finding it. Can can the court reporter hear me at this volume? I, yes. Okay. I feel like I was yelling, but I was wanting really to make sure that uh, you could hear me. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so if we go to 1133.08, we're talking about accessory reduced regulations. And in parent A, it's talking about the minimum yard requirements for accessory uses. That sends us on to schedule 1133.08, parent A, Uh, 
is on the next page. And under use item, believe we're looking at item C, the unenclosed deck, porch, ramp, steps, or similar structure exceeding 3.5 feet in height. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, and there's... And... We look there in the front, it says NA for a front setback line, which is not allowed. And where we're the front now is clarified in 1133.05, where we talk about the yards for corner lots that's parent d and parent one and this would be b the corner side yard abutting a front yard which is the situation with the property before you uh, where the rear lot line of the corner lot coincides with the side lot line of an interior lot, the corner side yard shall comply with the requirements for a front yard, including subsection B above for front yard dimensions on built up blocks. And because there are, are they R2F or R50? They're, they're 35 feet. R2F. And under definitions of definition number 121 for yard, where we go to the yard corner side, uh, we start also talking about the similar language that we were looking at in 1133.05, parent D, parent 1B. Okay, so I, I need to make sure I understand this. Um, this is a, you're considering this an unenclosed deck, porch, ramp, step, or similar structure exceeding three and a half feet in height. This is considered a front yard. So where, so yeah, so the the dimension required for a front yard is found and. Hey, Clint, uh, Mr. Dahl's waving his hands. I think he wants to be unmuted. Oh, okay. I don't know who's got the, the mute button, but I think he needs to be unmuted. Yeah, 11, well, it's 11.33.05. It's under the yard requirements, parent G. Right. That's where you were looking earlier with the 35 foot for the front yard on the single family R2. Uh, okay. I don't think we addressed my question about this falling under the definition of an accessory building or structure under your definitions. I don't think that addressed it. It told us how, I mean, 
I've given up on trying to figure out and or fight you on the idea that this side yard is actually a front yard. That's what they say, that's what they say, but how does anything make this a an accessory building, accessory structure under the accessory section of the law? And I will unmute myself and I will wave again when I would like to be unmuted again. Well, I'm looking at 113308 and it says an accessory building structure or use permitted in an R district, which is what we have here, where we're at here, an accessory and accessory to a dwelling and it shall be located as set forth in schedule 113308A. And we look down at the schedule, unenclosed deck structure patio, it says front, it says NA. So then how do we go, how does that, uh, that, so we have structure and building there, and then that applies to, how does that tie back to 113.305? Again. Because 113305 seems to apply to principal buildings. Right, right. No, and not, I. Not structures or accessories. Refresh my memory here on the notice of violation. So, yeah, notice of violation says 113305, and I'm that's what threw me for a loop the first time is how is that thing? There's a 35 foot setback for a for a gazebo that isn't part of the building. Yeah, no, I beg your pardon. It's it's item A in that schedule as opposed to the, the C detached accessory building and other accessory building. And then we have the parent one and the parent two in that line on there. That's that's how that was all tied together with that parent two. If we go down to the notes to the schedule 113308A1. Uh, shall comply with corner side yard requirements set forth in section 113305. So the the differentiation here was that this structure is a roofed type structure. It would be similar to um, a carport or uh, you know anything else where the that structure or building would have a roof on it. Okay, so did we recite the right ordinance in the notice of violation? The section cited in the notice of violation is the uh, where this schedule sends you essentially that the end result, if you will. With with a specific reference to the um, parcel configuration with the 
corner side yard abutting a front yard. Okay. And Mr. Dahl wants to be unmuted again. And again, Mr. Zollinger, no, no, uh, no offense intended, but I mean, you're using the general term "we also," like I kind of use the "you," so I'm. It's not a problem. Just understand that I'm trying to signify you as the city of Canton, like you're identifying we as the city of Canton. So, well, this is a city of North Canton and North Canton. I'm sorry for doing that. I, I'm, I, what I'm trying to do, Mr. Dahl, is try to figure out how this provision applies to a gazebo. So, and I'm know. still trying to figure out how, because this is all in the accessory building. And if you, again, if you go back to the simplicity of the definitions, the definitions that are under accessory don't apply to this gazebo and I'm gonna mute myself again and I'll wave to you if I feel the need. Okay, if somebody else on the board sees this, I'm having trouble finding where 1133.05 applies to structures or accessory buildings. Um, I understand. I, I know it's been ex explained, but I'm having trouble following this because I don't see where it it it, it does. Anybody see that? I have it open, and I'm looking as well. And really, does it apply to structures? Because I think that's what we have here. It, it, assuming it's not attached to the property, let's assume it's not a fixture. Does it apply to structures? And, if, and I'm seeing in paragraph A under 113308 where it says an accessory building comma structure or permitted use in, <coughs> in, in our district and accessory to a dwelling unit shall be located as set forth in schedule 113308A. Okay. And then I look at A and it says N-A. For the front yard, yeah. And then if we go, um, so, so if we go to the side yard, so if, I mean, and I think we've got to look at it as though for a second, that if this wasn't on a corner, that would be a side yard generally. So normally we'd be looking at a side yard, but that parent two, sends us down to the notes and that's where we start getting into the differentiation of the corner side yard and the requirements set forth in 1133.05 parent d okay and yeah, yeah just to back up a second you're, you're saying parent two you're looking at item f in 1133.08 a1 the schedule and oh no, you're not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Never mind. Scratch that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The item two under eleven thirty three oh eight a for purposes of setbacks an attached garage shall be considered part of the principal building and shall require comply with the yard requirements. Then item B, where 
where in item B is this? Oh, you know, what I'm, when I was referring to the number two, I'm notes to schedule 113308A1. I was, I'm actually referring to that note to number two under the footnotes there on that schedule 113308A1. Okay, I see now 113305. Right. Yeah, my apologies. I was not looking right at that. Okay. All right, I see how that's working together now. Um, So it's, it's notes to schedule 1133.08A1, note number two, shall comply with the corner yard side requirements set forth in 1133.05D. And we go up to 1133.05D. And we see what the setbacks are for a corner yard. And it shows us at R2F for single family front yard, 35 feet. And for in a corner yard, the, the side yard is going to be treated like a front. So that's supposed to be 35 feet. Is, am I following that right? I believe so. Anybody? But I, you know, and of course, there's the argument that other properties on the street have are inside of that, which is another issue. But I, um, I just want to make sure there is actually an ordinance that says that requires. And I, I see it now. Um, anything else, uh, Mr. Dahl? He on that issue needs unmuted okay hi uh again you look to the definition it doesn't apply and that's essentially my argument on uh section three it's not an accessory building it's not an accessory structure the section that deals with uh Accessory, uh, 1133, oh, I think it might even be all of 1133, talks about accessory uses, and uh, it's not an accessory use, I, as far as I'm concerned. Again, I have my brief. I'm standing on my brief. I don't, uh, I don't see any reason to beat this any longer unless you of course you want to and that's i guess fine with me all right um do you have anything that you want to say then with regard to violation three it it, it amounts to the same the same thing it's it doesn't it's not an accessory structure under your definition it's not an accessory building under your uh definition uh and I mean, if people are very, very intelligent, and I think you just had about a 15 or plus minute conversation trying to figure out if this was done properly or not. And I mean, that almost begs the argument. So um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna stand on my brief, thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Does anyone else want to speak on behalf of the application before I let people uh, who want to, anyone who wants to speak against it? 
If not, I will let uh, anyone who would like to speak against it can be unmuted. I have uh, Mary Hakem, a uh, professional real estate agent in uh, practicing in this area in, in North Canton, who basically, uh, Mary, tell us about the gazebo, the appearance, the value. Well, tell us about the appearance. <laughs> I can't hear. Oh, we can't hear. I haven't heard a word um, she has said. I just wanted to let you know that if the Anthony's were to decide that they were going to, for some reason, list their property, that gazebo would not be part of the real estate being sold because it is not a secured structure. It is not in any way permanent. It's a temporary structure that can be moved at any time. So it would be considered chattel as far as the real estate industry, you know, industry is concerned. Okay. Absolutely. It is not an eyesore in any way. Sorry, Mr. Dahl, Mr. Dahl, we couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. When it's been dealing with this property. Yeah, we still can't hear you. Wow. I'm sorry, my mic is a lot more directional than I thought it was. Uh, in dealing with this property, does it decrease the overall appearance of the property as, as a marketing, as part of marketing? All right, now I got to turn the mic back toward her more. It does not in any way decrease the value of the property, and it is good curb appeal with this particular gazebo. The property in general, is it well maintained? Are you asking me, Dean? Yes, yes it is definitely well maintained. And it's actually in much better condition than when it was purchased and it was great condition when she bought it. It's above <laughs> and pristine property right now. Thank you, Ms. Hakem. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Hakem? I do not. Does anybody else? No. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to take my life in my own hands here and open the floor up to uh, my clients for constructive comments, if they will. Anya Anthony, I just had a question. Um, has anyone in the that were sent out the letters? Has any of them complained or had any kind of issue with the gazebo? Have you had any feedback on that? I'm sorry. Who are you asking the question of? Uh, whoever, uh, whoever, you guys uh, sent out a wrong. letter to the to the neighbors, I guess, because uh, one lady came up to us and asked us about it. Ms. The Anthony, who are, who are you talking? Who are you asking the question to? Because the board doesn't know anything about what you're talking about. Uh, Mr. Van Gundy, I believe. Okay. Yes. So I have talked with one of the property owners whom we sent the notice to, mm -hmm. and to be quite frank, they were not addressing specifically the gazebo structure they were more concerned about the music being played so <laughs> we don't play yeah we don't play music during hours that we're not we go to bed at 9 30 10 p.m so that's ridiculous okay. um, well that's yeah. not considered part of this hearing of course yeah regardless yeah they didn't complain about the gazebo that's that was right. my question um right. also um we were also told in one of the letters, and I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, that we were encroaching upon, because of the gazebo, we were encroaching upon 60% of our backyard village, which is also kind of laughable because if you walk around, again, we see all kinds of stuff. Um, our backyard is what it was stated. And then we're also being told that this is our front yard. So we're kind of confused as to, is this our backyard or front yard or our side yard? 
Um, and another thing before I move away, um, I can count 20, at least 20 people stopping their vehicles to tell us how nice our property is. Um, uh, also, one other thing, we have 638 Portage Street Northwest is a um, council member's home. He bought the home in 2018. There is a pergola against the house. Um, so you might want to look into that. I thank you guys for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm back. Go ahead. Okay, excuse me, introduce yourself. Katie Anthony, 602 East Maple Street. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that the mayor has stopped over our house April 8th, I believe, and let us know that the um, house on Maple Street, three doors up from us, had been permitted to be taken down. And that, in fact, was a lie because I looked up the uh, CRC on the city council website and it on June 8th was um, included in that proposal to be taken over and torn down to improve the city. Uh, a, a few days ago, we had three cop cars show up at that residence doing an inspection and my wife had called the city asking if we needed to be concerned. Uh, they said no need to be concerned, but here we are with a vacant building that is subject to invite crime drugs, meth labs, three doors down when we have a family there a hundred feet away. And that's been allowed for the last five years while we've owned this residence, but yet we've constantly been fighting to improve upon the city, bring taxpayer dollars into the city, raise the property values of those homes around us, and we're constantly fighting. But yet here we are subjecting our family to meth labs, drugs, crime, police, all within a, a, a residence. Why? But you were heard. You're heard. You were heard. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, done speaking on behalf. I rest my case on my briefs. Okay. And what I've submitted, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. Uh, anyone else want to speak um, on behalf of the application before I turn it over to uh, the other side? Lucind, uh, yeah, someone. Chairman, if I may address one of the, might have been a question, I'm not sure, or comment at any rate. It was in regards to the 60%, there was um, a, an advisory noted in the in the letters that were sent out addressing the gazebo. And um, the hopes really was that there would be an application submitted in response to the uh, notice of violation or really the courtesy notice. Um, and that was really to, in hopes of preparing the applicant to make a complete submittal to best set them up for success on relocating the gazebo into a portion of the property that you know, we could consider under the zoning code. Um, and that is in the rear yard. And there is a provision in the zoning code that does limit the rear yard coverage to no more than 60%. So we felt that was um, helpful in putting that in there. Uh, it was in no way meant to uh, confuse the situation, but there is a distinction between the defined rear yard and the corner side yard. And the current location, um, for the record, is as defined in the zoning code is the corner side yard, is not the rear yard. Okay. Any questions of the board before we move to the other side? Um, we have a Lucinda Verplank to speak for. Okay. Um, she has admitted in 
chatting with the host that she has not sworn in, so she will need to swear. Okay. In. Go ahead and swear her in. Mm -hmm. uh, is it Lucinda? Yeah. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. Um, so I'm at 118 Pershing Avenue Southeast, which is directly next to um, Katie and Tanya's uh, residence. Um, me and my husband have lived here for approximately three years now since 2017. Um, in that time, I've watched them build up their backyard and make it from a small grassy area into a really nice um, well put together area where it actually inspires us to improve our own house and it brings up our own property value. Um, it would be detrimental to us, I think, to see that gazebo come down because it does bring up the whole uh, value of the neighborhood. Um, I would also like to point out that I think that during the time that they put up the gazebo in the first place, the offices were closed due to the coronavirus. So I'm not sure if you guys would have, um, if the zoning or permit um, offices would have been open to contact in the first place. Um, as far as I can tell, with the proximity to the, the street, um, there's no hindrance to be able to see out um, to affect in any way people turning onto the street or tur people turning off to the street. I have to drive to work every day and I have not been affected by it except that I enjoy looking at it. Um, if there's any questions to from them or to me, I'd be happy to answer them, but that's my argument. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? All right, I figure if that's it, ma'am, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, anybody else on behalf in favor of the application? We do not, sir. Okay, then uh, let's go with uh, hear from the other side if there's anybody that wants to speak against. Yes, we have Mr. Chuck Osborne. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I am speaking with regards to the application before you from the property owners at 602 East Maple Street for a variance. Grace Hopper, an early computer programmer and later a U.S. Navy Rear Admiral, is credited with saying, and I quote, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission, close quotes. I am sure most of you have heard this saying in your lifetime. This is clearly what we have before us today. I sincerely hope this is not how we want the citizens of North Canton to treat our zoning code. The appellants in this action should be very well versed on the city's zoning code as they have had multiple appearances before this board over the year. And I'm sure in each of those occasions, they have become well-versed with our zoning code. At each appearance, it has been made perfectly clear that a side lot for a corner property has the same restrictions as the front yard. There is also an expression that comes to mind with regard to this property, and it is, and I quote, give someone an inch and they'll take a mile. The property the appellants now occupy was given two variances, which allowed the construction of, of the house a decade or so ago. Since the appellants purchased this property, they have installed a massive hot tub on the back porch. North Canton Zoning Code does not even address such an installation directly, as I don't think most people would even dream of doing such a thing. But surely the code would have had regulated this action in some manner. The appellants slipped this in under the radar. Last year, the appellants installed an above ground pool, which occupies a majority of the backyard. The pool itself may just barely meet the 10 foot setbacks, but the peripheral equipment, the circulation pump, sits within the 10 foot setback 
required under the code. This was overlooked and a permit given to construct the pool. In addition to the fact that the gazebo does not meet setback requirements, the gazebo also has been outfitted with lighting that brings up additional concerns. I do not wish any misfortune or hardship for the appellants. Sadly, they cannot maintain any civility as when they see either me or my wife, they extend their middle finger when they drive past our house and are so distracted flipping us off that I am afraid they are going to lose control of their vehicle. I actually admired them last year during their presentations before this board as they were very civil and professional. Now they show their true selves and their actions are far from civil or professional. This corner lot is on display for the world to view. I believe that the granting of multiple variances early on and other actions by the city has rendered North Kent zoning code as meaningless in the eyes of the property owners before you tonight. <clears throat> Please rein in this highly overbuilt playground and stand by our zoning code and res store respect for the laws of North Canton. Lawfully enacted laws protect our community. Also, I would like to add the following remarks. Uh, for Mr. Zollinger, the uh, zoning code was originally passed in 2003. I was chairman of ordinance and rules. Back then, it was an entire rewrite of our zoning code. So, and also, I would like to speak to Mrs. Clevenger's remarks, and I wholeheartedly agree with you, Mrs. Clevenger. Their workload could have been cut to a bare minimum if they had simply picked up the phone and called and talked to the horse's mouth. They would have been, the city would have been more than happy to have walked them through what they could and couldn't do per the code. As far as citing all these other uh, so-called infractions of our code, we do not know when these infractions took place. These are older neighborhoods, and I'm sure much of this went in prior to the code. And even if we do have some violations after the code, two wrongs do not make a right. Just because it's been done wrong elsewhere, doesn't mean we're paving the way to continue to ignore our code. So I'm gonna let the board do what they should do. I hope you uphold our zoning code. It is meaningful, it protects our neighborhoods, and it's there for a purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else to speak against the application? I'd like to thank Mr. Uh, Osborne for pointing out that 2003 is when the uh, the zoning went in uh, was in went into enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Thank you. Is anybody else want to speak against the application? We have no one else sign up, sir. Okay, thanks. Um, Chairman Dahl, do you have anything briefly you want to say in rebuttal before? Uh, we vote. He needs unmuted. I'm trying. I tried. Uh, no, we can hear you now. Thank you very much. I uh, I do apologize. I didn't want to turn this into what seems like an antagonistic thing, although it did. Maybe my fault. If it is totally my fault, I totally apologize. But. Uh, Thank you for your time. I know you all have uh, lives outside of this. So have a good evening. We'll sit back and I will mute again. All right. Thank Chairman, you, a couple things, if I may, before you go to vote. Yes. Which came up in the opposition in, uh, and, I, and I think it is worth noting, the pool was permitted, as was the fence. Um, we did find those to be in compliance with the zoning code. The peripheral equipment is not specifically addressed in the code. 
Uh, we did find that it's attached by flexible means and can be moved readily, even if it was addressed. Um, the other thing we're noting is uh, we did find that they were only approximately 37% coverage, uh, although it, I will say it, it, if you were to look at it, uh, you might think it was much closer to the 60% of the permitted coverage, but based on the calculations that we did in that time, uh, we came up with approximately 37% of coverage. Um, and it, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask uh, just one question that uh, came up in the, the comments for Mr. Van Gundy. There was a, a kind of an open statement that perhaps the building department, because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions, may have been closed or may have not been accepting any applications for building or zoning uh, uh, permits or variances. So I, I wanted to check if uh, indeed there was any, any closure during that time or if they remained open uh, business as usual. So staff was working. Uh, we did have um, access to staff via email and telephone. The doors were locked and we were closed to the general public. However, we did make, um, uh, well, we revised our procedures to continue business during the COVID closure while maintaining the governor's orders. Thank you. And the mayor's orders, of course. Okay. Um, Anything else? If not, I'd like to get get on with the um, the voting. Um, I'll give you my thoughts, and if any other board member wants to chime in, that's fine. Um, I believe this is a structure as defined by the code. Our our job is limited. I, I say this at every one of our meetings, and Mr. Dahl, this is why, and I apologize if I lashed out at you a little bit by saying, you guys, I consider us an independent body. We're not employed by the city. We're private citizens. We're not paid for this. Um, we take our job seriously, but we we're an independent body. We're more like a, ju a judicial body. And when you ask us for variances or to hear appeals, my, my feeling is, especially with variances, you're asking us to change what elected people have put into place because of a very special circumstance. So it's a very limited role we play. And our job is to look at what the ordinances say when it comes to appeals, like whether a zoning certificate is required. You know, I look at the ordinances and try to figure out, is, there, is this really apply here? And I believe with regard to violation one, the zoning certificate is required because this is a structure as defined by the ordinance. Now, if the ordinance in the ordinance is, is sufficiently clear that a structure is just anything constructed or erected, um, it could mean you know things other than a gazebo. But I think this this gazebo being the size it is and the dimensions that it is, that that would be considered a structure. So that's just my feeling. That's just my opinion. I don't know what the other board members think about it. Um, I did do I did look at the, the law and the ordinances pretty sufficiently. Uh, and that's how I, uh, you know, that's how I feel about that. So that I do think a zoning certificate is required as for violation two in the setback. I, it, it does look like the interplay between 1133.05 and 1133.08 requires a 35 foot setback here in this situation. Um, I don't see any, I, I don't see that the, the burden of proof for a, um, uh, a variance, which requires special circumstances, a lot of different factors um, have been met here uh, for a variance and the same with regard to violation number three. Um, there hasn't been evidence submitted uh, to support special circumstances. And I also believe that because this is a structure um, that, that, that those ordinances apply to those items. 
Um, I would say, you know, like I said before, any evidence that uh, uh, the city has granted permits for an app, like a basic apples to apples comparison, I'd want to hear that. I don't want to see anybody treated differently. And if the city granted a uh, a certificate in this situation to somebody else uh, and, and, and is treating your clients differently, Mr. Dahl, then I would want to, I would take that into consideration and I would, I would say, well, then we're not going to apply this to somebody else. I haven't heard evidence of that. There's 965 Fair Oaks. The city has said they, they weren't aware of that structure, that they're going to follow up on it. They're, that, they're probably going to end up in front of this board and we'll have to look at that situation and see if it's, if it's similar or not. And, and if it is, then we'll, they'll be probably, they're going to be, if it's a similar situation to this one, then it, the result's going to be similar. I would, I would, would hope. Uh, so that's, that's um, my position. Um, I want to hear what other board members have to say or think about this, but that's where, where what I'm looking at right now. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Mr. Dahl's waving again. Well, it's we're we're done, uh, Mr. Dahl. I'd like to hear from the other board members first. Um, we've we've listened to every both sides, and I want to hear what other board members have to say right now. Um, and then I'll give you a chance to speak again, briefly. Thank you. Well, I, I Chris Clevenger, um, I just feel like this could have all been avoided had a simple phone call been made, and it's very clear that you should always call first and ask. And, and the office was available for a phone call or an email. Um, and I don't believe that they've met the requirements that they need, need to meet. I mean, it's unfortunate, it's a nice looking structure and perhaps something could have been worked out or adjusted, you know, had they checked first. Yeah, I think if a simple permit was pulled, we could have maybe avoided the second and third things on the list by following the ordinances in place. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Mr. Dahl, did you have something you wanted to add before we vote? Can't hear you. There we go. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, I realize my time is up. However, I do feel the need to say I began the presentation by saying I was perfectly willing to allow my brief to speak on its own. And I proceeded to begin with going through the specific 10 items that are required to request a variance. And I was turned off or shut down uh, after beginning to speak on item number C. So to say that I haven't met my burden on the variance, I simply would say my time is up. You have turned me down uh, for additional evidence. It's understandable, but it wasn't due to my trying as much as it was to being told that we were there to deal with those three items. And with that, uh, please continue with your vote. Well, I, I disagree with that, Mr. Dahl, because I did ask you your position with regard to the violation two and three, and you had an opportunity to speak then as to those 10 items. He's muted. I have, I have nothing further to say. I... I'm muted. I'm glad I'm muted. And I'm glad I'll be able to present this and everything else that we will have in front of the Court of Common Pleas if you vote the way you do. I mean, it's, I thank you for your time again. But I don't, I do feel like I was, I was making a presentation and I was shut off, Mr. Zollinger, and I 
Thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you. At this point, we will uh, do a roll call for the vote. Ms. Boyjan? No. Mr. Zollinger? Uh, no. Ms. Clevenger? No. Mr. Streb? Abstain. Mr. LePage? No. Um, I, I actually would like to, for purposes of the record, I think we need to do the vote again. Um, our, we're going to, we're doing a vote as to all three violations in the notice. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make that clear. Um, so let's call the roll again. Uh, with it, and this is with respect to all three violations in the notice of violation uh, dated May 1st, 2020. Go ahead and do that again. I'm sorry. Ms. Boyjan? No. Mr. Cle uh, Ms. Clevenger, I'm sorry. No. Mr. Bellinger? No. Mr. Streb? Abstain. Okay, the, applica the application is denied based on that vote. I don't think I called Mr. LePage. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. LePage. Sorry. No. Okay, the application is denied. Um, thank you. We'll move on to the next item of business. Application number 20, NCZ BOA-0002. Adam and Christina Romans, 891 Honeysuckle Drive, North Canton. A variance request for a reduced corner side yard. Okay, um, I think we need to swear in anybody who's going to testify with regard to this application. Okay, we have two, uh, two individuals, Adam and Christina Romans, who will be sworn in at this time. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. All right, thank you for your patience. Uh, that was a, a rather long one before you. Um, is there anybody else that's going to testify uh, either on behalf of or against the application that's present? At this time, no members of the public had expressed an interest in testifying in this case. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moore, you can proceed if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we get into our case, uh, that was very illuminating. And, and we do appreciate the time and the effort on behalf of the citizens of North Canton that all of you make, including uh, the zoning officials and the law director. Uh, we appreciate that. It's volunteers like you that make North Canton a very special place to live. So uh, uh, I, I'll go ahead and proceed. I'll, I submitted a statement or a brief in the, on behalf of the Romans, uh, and I believe that was submitted last Thursday. Uh, so I hope you all have had an opportunity to review it. Um, I apologize it wasn't submitted a little earlier. Uh, the... The statement, uh, I'll try to summarize that position and then uh, allow you to ask questions of the applicant. Uh, the, the Romans have three children. They live in North Canton. They've lived there for approximately 15 years. And re recently, Adam's father passed away, and they decided that they would buy a lot and build a new residence in uh, in sanctuary number four. So they acquired a, uh, a lot, lot number 166. It's one of the larger lots in sanctuary number four. And it uh, allows them to have Adam's mother move in with them along with their three kids. And what is important in this case, prior to purchasing that lot, 
they wanted to make sure that they could actually proceed to build the residence uh, that they desired. So they made sure that they had conditions in the purchase agreement with uh, the developer. The developer in that case is one of Bob Dehoff's companies. I believe it's called McKinley Apple Group. And they had conditions in there allowing for the architect for the developer to approve that. He, in fact, did approve it. They submitted a site plan to them, and it was approved. Um, after obtaining that approval, they, they made contact with the city of North Canton uh, building department, including the zoning department, and requested that they look at uh, the site plan. Uh, uh, Christina Roman is, uh, let's say, relatively new in new construction. And so she wanted to make sure she was reviewing the zoning regulations appropriately. And she made contact uh, with the building department to review that. Um, they uh, proceeded to close on the lot only after they obtained both the developers in the North Canton, North Canton's approval to, uh, to build this home on that lot. And the documentation identifying that is attached as exhibits uh, to my statement. Uh, so they, they proceeded to move forward uh, with the construction and the digging of the uh, excavating of the uh, basement and proceeded with the installation of the footers. Um, they in fact obtained a, uh, an approval on, on the footers I believe it was on June 3rd, and they uh, were moving along with the expenditure of approximately $138,000 for the lot plus the closing, and then an additional $100,000 uh, by releasing uh, certain orders for non-refundable items, such as the lumber package, the steel beams, um, a number of window package, much of which was custom for this home. Uh, then they were surprised and it was a difficult time for them because on June 8th, they were advised by the zoning inspector that uh, there in fact was a setback violation. They were completely unaware of the setback violation before they uh, proceeded and in fact had felt that it was uh, being built in compliance with the regulations. They had the, the property staked before they started construction. And after we received the information from Mr. Van Gundy uh, and uh, the building department, they had it resurveyed and in fact uh, was determined that there would be a setback and a uh, setback violation. And that setback violation um, is not consistent because the uh, the lot or the, the roadway, Dunway, has a substantial curvature to it. So it's at 4.4 feet uh, at one location and 7.2 feet at another location. The average is approximately 5.8 feet. We had that measured from the, the uh, property line and not from the roadway in accordance with uh, Martin's determination. Uh, we would submit at this time that uh, there are special conditions and circumstances that now exist that relate to this lot and that would justify this variance request. Uh, certainly the applicant in this case proceeded in good faith with every effort trying to make sure that she was in compliance with the uh, building and zoning requirements along with the covenants and conditions. She's learned a lot from uh, this experience and now recognizes there's private use and public use restrictions on the construction of the residence. What's interesting with this lot is it's one of the larger lots uh, in, the, in, in this phase four, and it is a corner lot, much like the earlier application. And the corner lot, uh, we now understand, has a setback that is equivalent to the fronting to the front 
uh, yarn setback requirements on the side lot. So we now understand that. And, uh, uh, but even though we understand that, if you look at this lot on Honeysuckle, that is where their front yard is going to be. It's going to fit consistently with other homes in this allotment. The front door will be on Honeysuckle. The side uh, setback will be is in compliance on the one side, and the rear setback is in compliance. The only non-compliance is because of the unique requirements on corner setbacks. If you looked at the front yard, you will see that it not only complies, it complies by approximately nine feet. If you look to the rear yard, it, it has almost 70 feet of rear yard, so it's in substantial compliance. The reason why I want to go over that, because it, it demonstrates that the square footage of the home on this lot is going to be consistent or better than most homes in the allotment. So I think that's relevant to your determination. Uh, we also look at the potential adverse effect of this, uh, what we would consider to be uh, the least uh, uh, amount of variance that we could request at this time. There's not gonna be a line of sight issue. There's not gonna be parking issues. And there's plenty of parking area available in the driveway so that it would not block any sidewalk usage. So we don't think there's an adverse effect. We did have an opportunity to talk with the developer, the owner of the development, and they are totally supportive of this variance request. And he was uh, uh, of the opinion that this home would be uh, of substantial value to other people who would build within phase four of, of uh, the sanctuary. So uh, they are supportive and would like to see this move forward. I'd be happy to provide after this an affidavit from this individual if you would, if you would like that. Um, it so happens that he still owns the two lots across the street, the two lots that are adjacent. So he owns, I think, all of the lots that you sent the letters to. And I think that's important because uh, if the neighbors are supportive of this variance, generally that's a good thing when a board uh, looks at determining whether or not yeah. they're going to grant the variance. Um, so, Mr. Van Gundy, it sounds like was there a, an inadvertent error in the, approving this, or what, what's what happened here? Unfortunately, there was. And as I mentioned in the previous case, in light of the COVID-19, we did make a number of changes to accommodate the revised work structures in that. And why that's relevant is uh, we did switch to more of an electronic review. This was uh, the site plan, plan particularly was one of the um, documents that was submitted for review. And as I understand, uh, when the reviewer was performing this review, um, was under the understanding and to uh, just based on memory of the development that this parcel was abutting another corner parcel, which would have made this a 20 foot required side yard for that corner side yard setback, as opposed to the 40 uh, that is required for the corner side yard abutting a front yard in the R70 zone district. Um, you know, I would like to add that, uh, you know, as, as part of that, um, you know, how this came to my attention was in the revised process, I was under the understanding that this had not been issued and um, was going to place an electronic stamp on the document. And when I did, I had observed that this side yard um, 
did not meet the requirements for the 40 foot corner side yard or the front yard uh, requirements on that. And um, I, I believe it's important to add that when I contacted Ms. Romans, um, as shocking as this information was, um, she'd immediately, if not nearly immediately, stopped construction and did pursue the variances we talked about. Uh, you know, I did explain that I do not have the authority to vary the code, only the Zoning Board of Appeals has that authority. Um, and hence the application uh, before you. And um, I think, you know, as in, in those conversations, um, you know, looking at a site plan that that electronic document I mentioned was an electronic review, was prepared by a, a surveyor. Um, and you know, Ms. Romans had mentioned that this site plan was also submitted to the HOA. Um, so why that's relevant is I that did cause me to do some more uh, research and looking at what I wanted to look at was to see if the Planning Commission had approved um, a different setback based on other requirements or provisions in the code. That was not the case. That did not take place. However, uh, it, it does appear that um, this was prepared and approved in conflict with the code and construction had. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. If, if I uh, may, uh, you know, certainly the when when a, a setback comes into play, one of the important aspects is if indeed in granting this variance, how this uh, one uh, in, impacts um, public safety. So I, I believe the, the building department uh, has looked at the issue of the, the line of sight. And if, uh, Roger, if you would introduce yourself and, and kind of explain that to the board, uh, your, your review. Can you swear me in? Yeah, raise your right hand. Please solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be got. I do. Thank you. Roger, what's your last name? Roger E. Miller. Thank you. What's your title? I'm the building electrical RBO inspector for the city of North Canton and also do some zoning reviews. And you're qualified to do a line of sight review? I've been in construction for over 45 years, working with those surveyors, transit, and pulling lines to evaluate location of property without uh, necessarily, but yes, we do have a line of sight clearance. And uh, have you done that line of sight inspection uh, with the, the view of having this, um, this variance in place and is, indeed you have, what, uh, what's your determination? We actually use, we use uh, the new adopted ordinance for the 25 feet triangle. There is no question there is sufficient line of sight. There is sufficient parking to the south side of the driveway that would not impede any progress or increase or decrease line of sight. It also leaves the sidewalk free and clear if she has a large vehicle parked there. So we see no line of sight issue and no question whatsoever. Once that road, uh, once honeysuckles continued further than the next development phase. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? You know, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say uh, one more thing, and that would be that um, the the applicant in this case worked very closely in uh, the, the North Kent building officials uh, worked very good with, with the applicant. And when this issue came up, um, you know, they could have, Look the other way. Um, they did not do that. They said that there was one body that could that could approve this, and that's what resulted in us coming here for the variance. So it, I think, 
you should be uh, take comfort with the fact that uh, Martin Van Gundy and Roger Miller are uh, very reputable people within the building department. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, one uh, one last thing that before we proceed for those that uh, any others uh, in the public would wish to, to speak. I think this board uh, is is certainly well aware in the issue of, of variances where perhaps someone is asking for something better than what the conditions of their, their situation uh, apply. And often in those circumstances, they're getting a benefit from this variance that they're requesting. And oftentimes someone else and perhaps the, the public at large or a neighbor or, uh, or another you know, property you know, within sight that is uh, impacted by this is harmed in some way. It, it, uh, they receive less because the person uh, asking for the, the variance is getting more than they're entitled. Here, however, uh, when I first had a notice of this, I immediately was working with the building officials because it is a significant issue and uh, poured over uh, all of these um, documents, the timelines, and those involved with this. And my conclusion uh, of this is no one other than the applicant is getting something less than, than perhaps what they bargained for. The applicant themselves believed in good faith through their, their architect, architect uh, through the surveyor, and through the building department, and was very cautious in, in making certain steps because we knew that uh, many of these things were going to be non-refundable because they, this is a special build, special trusses, uh, uh, special ex excavating and footers, and they were very cautious, and uh, in the end, what they're asking for is the ability to take it as it stands when they're the one that, that's going to get a little bit less than, than what they bargained for, and it doesn't appear that anyone else is going to be impacted by this it's only the applicant themselves that are asking for uh, the board to uh, approve uh, that they receive a little bit less and clearly that no one else is, is impacted um, by this situation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I'm pretty, I, I think I understand that. Um, does anybody else have anything with regard to this application? If not, I'd like to... Uh, Anybody on the board have any thoughts, questions? If with that being said, if not, then I would suggest we um, move forward with a vote. I, I'm in. I, I don't know if, you, is there anyone from the public? Yeah, is there anybody from the public that's joined us? No, sir. Okay. I, I'm inclined to grant the variance. Um, I don't, um, I the application, the applicants of um, their, their conduct in this is exactly what you'd want to see. And uh, frankly, um, you know, uh, uh, an inadvertent mistake by uh, another, you know, a, a very competent city official, um, they shouldn't be penalized for that. It's, this isn't hurting anybody else. Uh, this is why very, this is why we have, why we exist. This is why um we have the ability to get the power to grant variances. So that's my thoughts and feelings on it. Anybody else have anything before we vote? Okay, with that, then I'll entertain a motion either to approve or deny the variance. If somebody can make that motion and second it. Motion to approve. Okay. I second. <laughs> Always. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll call the roll for the vote, please. Mr. Zollinger. I vote to approve the variance. 
Ms. Clevenger? I vote to approve the variance. Ms. Boykin? I vote to approve the variance. Mr. Streb? I vote to approve the variance. Mr. LePage? I vote to approve the variance. Okay, the variance is granted. Uh, you, can get, you can start building again. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry you had to wait so long. Uh, Mr. Chairman, he did, uh, Adam did tell me that uh, your son threw a fastball last night and may have hit his son. <laughs> he hit a couple, they probably did. He hit a couple people. He was, uh, it's all or nothing with him. There's nobody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for uh, your your time. It, it it was two hours for the prior one. I apologize, but it it was uh, deeply contested, and uh, I think uh, everyone that had the ability to speak did and spoke volumes. And unfortunately, you were the the second state of application. So sorry for your wait. That's okay. Right. We appreciate your time and service. Thank right. you, sir. We are, we're going to, I'll do a mo voice motion to adjourn our meeting. All Aye. those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Good night, Good night guys. And to those here. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.